In today's video, I'm going to analyze the pronunciation of a native English speaker who, if what he says about his background is true, is a rare language learning prodigy. Since I have no reason to believe he's lying, I have to conclude that he is a prodigy. You'll see what I mean when you listen to his recordings. He's asked to remain anonymous, but he's provided this information about himself. He's a native English speaker from the United States. He's 21 years old, and he started learning Spanish when he was 15. He had no Spanish influence in his home, and Spanish is not a heritage language for him. So in that sense, he was an ordinary second language learner. No unfair advantages. He became interested in Spanish after befriending someone his age who had recently moved to the United States from Mexico and who didn't speak English. He began learning Spanish from that friend, studying independently and attending Spanish Mass at his parish. He studied Spanish in college and got his bachelor's degree in it, but he still feels that a majority of what he's learned has been through informal interaction and personal study, not formal education. He's now a Catholic seminarian, preparing to become a priest. He says that he has frequent opportunities to speak Spanish where he lives, and he says that he'll undoubtedly speak it frequently as a priest. All right, with that background, let me give you my analysis of our friend's Spanish and prepare your ears so you know what to listen for as we listen to his recordings. Our friend has extremely accurate Spanish phonetics and phonology. He pronounces almost every sound accurately and every phonological rule correctly almost all the time, even the little nitpicky ones. He's so accurate that if I were to talk about everything he does well, we'd be here all day. So instead, I'm going to mention just one phonological rule that native English speakers have a hard time with that he does in a very native-like way. Voiced S. Both Spanish and English sometimes pronounce the S phoneme voiced. Z. But the rules that describe when to voice S are very different between the two languages. I'm not going to describe in detail the English rules, but let's look at some examples. Consider the words dogs, cats, and houses, and observe that the plural S of dogs and houses is voiced, while the plural S of cats isn't. Dogs, houses, cats. This is not how it's done in Spanish. Because of our intuitive, internalized phonology, we English speakers tend to want to pronounce Spanish words like casas with a voiced plural S, casas. So we tend to want to voice Spanish S when we shouldn't. But another problem we have is that we fail to voice Spanish S when we should. In Spanish, when speaking in such a way that they enunciate and articulate carefully, native speakers may not voice S. But when speaking normally and casually, not paying attention to how they're speaking, they tend to voice S when it appears immediately before voiced consonants. So in casual speech, los días would be pronounced los días. El mismo hombre would be pronounced el mismo hombre. And desvanecer would be pronounced desvanecer. It's hard enough for native English speakers to consistently pronounce Spanish S without the voicing pattern of English, but it's particularly difficult for us to correctly and consistently apply the voicing pattern of Spanish and only when speaking casually. In these recordings, our friend pronounced Spanish S's, both voiced and voiceless, in a way that sounds natural and native-like. This is just one example of a phonological rule that our friend applied very well. Honestly, I could have used any of the phonological rules of Spanish for this example because he did them all correctly. All right, so what about areas where he could use improvement? Well, there were really only two areas where I felt he made any mispronunciation that approached a pattern. Number one, reducing unstressed vowels. I found a few instances where our friend reduced unstressed vowels. So he pronounced toda la operación more like toda la operación. Otro lado de la casa more like otro lado de la casa. Desesperado more like desesperado. And iba a empezar something like iba a empezar. Number two, English E, P, T, and K phonemes. Our friend usually pronounced the Spanish voiceless stops very well, but I felt that he occasionally pronounced them with a bit of English-style aspiration. So, for example, he pronounced si conseguía, like si conseguía, cada vez que, like cada vez que, and toda, like toda. He did this more frequently than case number one, and I would consider this more of a pattern, although he pronounced these sounds really well lots of the time too. So this still wasn't consistent. And that's it for mispronunciation that looked anything like a pattern. Of course, just like anyone else, he had some one-off boo-boos. He failed to assimilate the N in un momento, which he pronounced un momento. He didn't really pronounce a glottal stop, but he failed to link these two words entirely naturally. He sometimes pronounced the letter V as V, and I'm sure this was because of interference from his native English. 
but he usually pronounced V well, and since native speakers sometimes pronounce both B and V like V, I don't think anyone would notice. He pronounced a prolonged and rounded O at the end of a couple of words. So, for example, he pronounced resbalo, more like resbalo. He pronounced occlusive rather than approximate G in empezó a gatear, which he pronounced more like empezó a gatear. And he pronounced an English-style retroflex R in tocarlas, which he pronounced more like tocarlas. The truth is that native Spanish speakers might do some of these things when reading and articulating carefully anyway. So honestly, I'm being pretty nitpicky by mentioning them. With that introduction, let's listen to his recordings. As we listen and read along, each time our friend pronounces something that fits into one of the categories we've discussed, I'll highlight it so you can hear what I'm talking about. All right, here goes. Un momento más tarde, James volvía hacia la casa corriendo cuanto podía. Llevaría a cabo toda la operación en la cocina, pensó, si conseguía entrar sin que lo vieran la tía Sponge y la tía Spiker. Estaba terriblemente excitado. Atravesó volando, más que corriendo, la alta hierba y las ortigas, sin preocuparse de sus picaduras. Y a lo lejos vio a la tía Sponge y a la tía Spiker sentadas en sus mecedoras, de espaldas a él. Se desvió para evitarlas con la intención de entrar por el otro lado de la casa, pero de pronto, justo cuando pasaba por debajo del viejo melocotonero que estaba en medio del jardín, uno de sus pies resbaló y cayó de bruces en la hierba. La bolsa de papel se abrió al golpear el suelo y las miles de cositas verdes se desparramaron en todas direcciones. James se puso a cuatro patas inmediatamente y empezó a buscar sus preciados tesoros. ¿Pero qué era lo que estaba pasando? Se estaban hundiendo en el suelo. Pudo ver perfectamente cómo se revolvían y retorcían al abrirse camino en la dura tierra, y sin pérdida de tiempo estiró la mano para agarrar algunas antes de que fuera demasiado tarde, pero desaparecieron justo debajo de sus dedos. Trató de agarrar otras, pero sucedió exactamente lo mismo. Empezó a gatear frenéticamente en un intento desesperado de agarrar las que todavía quedaban, pero fueron demasiado rápidas para él. Cada vez que las puntas de sus dedos estaban a punto de tocarlas, desaparecían en el interior de la tierra. Y pronto, en cuestión de segundos, todas, todas sin excepción, habían desaparecido para siempre. A James le entraron ganas de echarse a llorar. Ya nunca podría recuperarlas, las había perdido, perdido para siempre. Pero, ¿a dónde habrían ido? ¿Y por qué motivo habían tenido tanta prisa en meterse en la tierra de aquella forma? ¿Qué andarían buscando? Allá abajo no había nada. Nada excepto las raíces del viejo melocotonero y un montón de gusanos sin pies e insectos que habitaban en la tierra. ¿Qué era lo que había dicho el anciano? El primero que encuentren, ya sea microbio, insecto, animal o árbol, recibirá toda la magia. Cielo santo, pensó James, ¿qué va a pasar ahora si encuentran un gusano, un sin pies o una araña? ¿Y qué pasará si llegan hasta las raíces del melocotonero? Triste y lentamente, el pobre James se levantó del suelo y se fue a la leñera. ¡Oh, si no se hubiera ca caído y desparramado aquella maravillosa bolsa! Toda esperanza de una vida más feliz se había desvanecido. Hoy, mañana y al día siguiente y los otros días, no habría más que castigos, dolor, infelicidad y desesperación. Agarró el hacha e iba a empezar a partir leña otra vez cuando oyó un grito a sus espaldas que le hizo detenerse y mirar. Cuando yo era niño, solía pasar los veranos en la casa de mi mejor amigo, pues hacía mucho calor y tenía alberca en su casa. Un día, me acuerdo que era un viernes 13, estábamos ahí en su casa nadando y su mamá nos gritó desde el patio vengan muchachos que hay una rana en el parasol así que salimos eh, del agua nos acercamos al parasol 
Mi amigo se puso a investigar y se dio cuenta de que no era ninguna rana, sino un murciélago, lo que estaba en el parasol. Y como los niños que éramos, decidimos atraparlo y lo único que tenían para hacerlo era una trampa para ardillas, eh, una jaula grande que había. Y este, mi amigo decidió entrar en su casa buscando una cámara y me dejó solo con el animal. Justo cuando él entró en la casa, el murciélago empezó a intentar escaparse por los hoyos que eran demasiado grandes para retenerlo. Y yo sabía lo enojado que iba a ser mi amigo si se escapara eh, por mi culpa. Eh, y este, entonces lo agarré con mi mano, me picó de una vez, lo solté y se fue volando. Marqué a mis papás después que estaban viendo una película en el cine y atemorizados vinieron por mí y fuimos a una clínica de urgencias. Dijo el médico que como los murciélagos son portadores de rabia, necesitaba vacunarme contra la rabia. Me tuvieron que dar cinco inyecciones en mi pobre pulgar y varios en los brazos, pero lo peor era cuando me tocaba las de la nalga. Todo esto era durante una fase de mi niñez cuando era más gordito y me quedaba aprieto mi traje del baño. Además de eso, la ropa y mi piel estaban algo mojadas todavía. Entonces la enfermera me volteó en esta cama de hospital y empezó a intentar bajarme el traje para darme la inyección y no podía. Y tuve que agarrarme de la barra de la cama con mi mano dolida mientras le daba fuerte una y otra vez. Y me quedé llorando por el dolor y la vergüenza que sentía hasta que por fin lo logró y, y estuve bien. En total fueron 13 inyecciones que se me tuvo que dar ese desafortunado viernes 13. So what can our friend do to improve his pronunciation? Well, I only mentioned two things and one of them was pretty infrequent. But if he wanted to, he could certainly work on correcting both of them. Friend, just be aware that native English speakers sometimes reduce unstressed vowels. Know that you sometimes have that tendency and concentrate on not doing it when speaking Spanish. This one's a bit bigger of a deal. If you improve this one, it would really put the finishing touches on your accent and make you close to perfect. You do pronounce your PT and K phonemes with too much tension and explosiveness, so you could practice reading aloud reducing the tension of these sounds. I've decided to make a video on this topic during the upcoming week, so watch for that to come out. It should help you. All right, so what rating would I give our friend on the Spanish pronunciation evaluation scale? Well, he speaks better than this because he applies correct Spanish phonology nearly 100% of the time, and he barely has any foreign accent at all. So we need the expanded scale to rate our friend. I feel that this description fits him well. Consistently uses correct Spanish phonetics and phonology. My only hesitation is in the word consistently. Does that mean 100% of the time without any mistakes? If it means that, then he falls short. If it means most of the time, or almost all the time, then this would be his rating. I think that because of the frequency with which he reduced unstressed syllables and pronounced the PT and K phonemes with aspiration or too much tension, and because those are stereotypical features of the English speaker foreign accent, I can't quite place him here. So for this recording, I would rate our friend as an 8+. Plus. And this agrees well with how I think native Spanish speakers would perceive his accent. I think a linguistically aware native Spanish speaker who is paying some attention would hear the things I've pointed out in this video, more or less right away. But I think he sounds native-like enough that most native speakers would initially assume that he's a native or native bilingual. And I think some native speakers wouldn't notice his foreign accent for some time, or maybe at all. And this puts him in the category of rare prodigies. I find it amazing that he's gotten his pronunciation this good through his own efforts in ordinary high school and college classes. Congratulations, friend. Your Spanish accent is truly enviable. All right, I hope you've enjoyed analyzing our American friend's accent with me. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more videos on Spanish pronunciation.